Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. If you love this watch, email me, tmosso at thewatchbox.com. It's in the description below. It is your purchase and pricing email question line for buying this or any watch you see on any of our platforms. Please reach out to me directly. My email is tmosso at thewatchbox.com for pricing. Today, we're discussing a modern classic, a legend in its own time. This is the Philippe Dufour Simplicity. Philippe Dufour was coming off of his Grand Sonnerie and Duality in the late 1990s, and according to his own account, he was asked by Japanese collectors to build something specific for that market as a result of the time period in which the watch was designed, as well as the proclivities of the target market. 34 millimeter and 37 millimeter versions of the Simplicity were offered starting in the year 2000 for the next roughly 20 years. Philippe Dufour crafted these watches at an exceedingly slow and careful rate before bringing in the 20th anniversary series for 2021. So the watch we have here is one of the 34 millimeter examples, and you can see it's got beautiful proportions at 34 in diameter, 8.4 thick, and then super short from lug tip to lug tip at 40.5 millimeters from lug to lug with an 18 millimeter spacing between the lugs. Although the watch is petite, it is by no means underwhelming. It is beautifully sized, shaped, broad enough to look larger than it is, and given the strength of those lugs, it comes across as more of a 36 or a 37. Now, the timepiece is flat, and with a domed bezel, it will slide underneath the cuff. I could recommend it for a wrist as small as 13 centimeters in circumference, so consider this to be the ultimate unisex option. The watches are highly sought in every size, every metal, and every dial configuration, but this one is particularly elegant. The strap is a Philippe Dufour factory piece. And you can see it has a combination of leather top and bottom, medium rectangular scale alligator leather in black. We have a sheer cut side, a monotone stitch on the bottom, a lovely medium brown, and then a buckle that is distinctive of the brand. And you can see like several components, Philippe Dufour either services the parts that he brings in from suppliers and modifies them, or he'll bring in parts from high-end suppliers who complete the work in the entirety, and he's very open about that. So he's not gonna hide maker's marks on buckles, nor is he gonna try in any way to obscure who made the dial, in this case, Metalem. Philippe Dufour, arguably even before the likes of Max Busser, very open about his collaborators in creating his masterpieces. The case is a masterpiece in its own right. As you can see, the dramatically sharp break between lug profile and case band, that is achieved by making the case and the lug separately and then welding them together and hand finishing to remove the gathered metal from the weld to create that super sharp break. And when you're going to be making 10 or fewer watches per year, this is the kind of low volume production that is not only acceptable, but expected. You can see that the case band is round with some compound curves worked in. We have a domed bezel. Don't worry, this watch is in excellent condition. It does feature some fingerprints. And if you wonder why not gloves, well, the answer is watches tend to get dropped with gloves. Would you risk dropping this watch? Taking a look at the crown, it's drawn from vintage inspiration as the watch recalls the types of 1950s through 1970s watches that Philippe Dufour restored during the restoration phase of his career. He also worked at Chagere Le Coult, Gérald Genta, Audemars Piguet during his time, of course, born in the Vallée de Joux and educated there at the École. He was steeped in the traditions of one of the watchmaking heartlands of Switzerland. Now, the dial, made by Metalem, of course, features a sunray pattern outboard under the hour track, and then inboard a spectacular billowing rose lathe pattern. That is real engine-turned guilloche, not the stamped kind. We have a stepped small second subdial with a loop style counterweighted lancet seconds hand. We have faceted rose gold dauphine hands at center with a beautiful polished cannon pinion underneath. 
and the faceting of the hands makes them stand out better against the dial. We have faceted dart style indices for the hours with polished and applied hours and indices including tri-Arabic numerals. On the reverse side, by the way, 30 meters water resistant, but really, really don't test that theory. This is gorgeous, and it's a surprisingly large movement for the case size, as this caliber is 30 millimeters in diameter and takes up every square millimeter of the case back. You can appreciate that the quality of the finish is second to none. Some will match, but none will surpass what you see here. From a technical standpoint, it gets more power than you would imagine out of a single mainspring barrel with a manual wind 52-hour power reserve. And by the way, that black polished and rounded click is vintage-inspired, very similar to the vintage-inspired click on a Laurent Ferrier, and they're drawn from the same historical traditions. That is an homage to old-time Swiss watchmaking. You can see it's been rounded and black polished across the entirety. We also have satination on both the ratchet wheel and the barrel cap, and the ratchet wheel teeth have been micro-beveled internally. All of this beats away at 18,000 vibrations per hour, pivots on 21 joules. We do have a free-sprung balance, which is a surprisingly forward-looking arrangement for a very backward-looking watch in many ways. So it beats away at 2.5 hertz, big and slow. It's almost the radius of the movement. We have a traditional pocket watch like center wheel architecture. We have a blued overcoil hairspring shaped by hand. So in every physical position, the watch will keep very consistent time. And the free spring architecture allows for very precise adjustment and also gives it a measure of shock resistance you wouldn't expect in a watch like this. Now underneath, you can see the bridge for the escapement lever has been snailed across its top and micro beveled on its edge. The locating pins that help to locate that bridge on the base plate have been mirror polished on their tops. If you look and you can see the anchor, you can see that it's been black polished across its upper surface and then beveled on its side. So even the parts that are difficult to see have been exquisitely finished. The Cote de Genève are incredibly bright and luminous. And perhaps more than any other watch I've ever shared on this channel, you could see the gradient of shading from one side to the other that distinguishes the best abrasive wheel Cote de Genève. Even even from lesser abrasive wheel Cote de Genève, never mind the stamped kind, we have rose gold plates with the individual number, as well as the text notifying you that this is Swiss made, rest assured, in its entirety, 21 jewels and made by Philippe Dufour. And this little plate right here has been fixed with blued screws. The only blued screws you'll find on the movement are used to fix these rose gold plates to the bridges. And then all the engraving done by hand with a burin immaculately. The other screws feature black polished heads and chamfered slots in circumference. These are the so-called 100 Swiss franc screws that take hours to create. The bridges are particularly thick, which allows this incredibly broad and deep anglage to be drawn across their flanks, but also slightly inboard over their surfaces. You could see we have no shortage of sharp interior angles here, most of them on brass, as you could see here and here and here, but also the steel black polished cap to the escape wheel features an inward angle, and that's difficult to achieve because steel is very hard. You can also see sharp outward points little devil's horns over the center. We are beautifully done. Satination on the wheels. Uh, there's polishing inside the wheels, but rather less interior beveling than I would have expected. There's interior polishing, but the bevels haven't been deeply drawn in the wheels, which is just a stylistic choice that Philippe Dufour made. He also made the choice to use exquisitely large and deep weld pivot jewels, especially over the center wheel. You can see each of the jewels features a mirrored countersink, and that's a truly gorgeous setup. You can also see we have, see how close I can get, that wonderful combination of matte finishing and solarization on the ratchet wheel and the barrel. Absolutely as good as it gets, leaving nothing to be desired. The most important finishing flourishes I find here are actually at the edge of the escape wheel cock and the balance cock, because if you look at those edges, you find incredibly sharp outward angles where two bevels converge on a point and it's easy to miss. This watch is simply the last word in attention to detail, beauty, and time invested to create something truly special. The Philippe Dufour simplicity will never be common. This is the only, well, this is the third example I've seen here in nine years. 
I saw one on the wrist of Claude Sapphire, so that's four in nine years total. Reach out to Team Asa with thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.